Hello, everyone, and welcome to our students and guests. Uh, my name is Pavlina Cherneva. I'm an associate professor of economics at Bard College, a research scholar at the Levy Economics Institute, and the director of the Economic Democracy Initiative at the Open Society University Network. Uh, welcome uh, to the speaker series uh, titled Democratizing Work After the Pandemic. Uh, we interrogate a number of questions on uh, democratizing work uh, in this uh, series, uh, specifically democracy in the workplace, um, guaranteeing the right to employment for all and securing uh, good jobs as we think about uh, the climate crisis and the green transition. We are very fortunate to have uh, Professor Noel Healy with us today, um, who has uh, had lots of uh, long research, teaching and activism in these areas. Um, he has focused on responses to the climate crisis and the normative dimensions of rapid climate change mitigation. The, his core work revolves around climate change politics, global climate governance, energy transformation, supply side climate policy, energy justice, um, and the link between uh, what we do in academia, uh, as well as in political activism and policymaking. Um, he, he has many projects uh, that he's been working on and is, is working on just some of them include the impact of fossil fuel resistance movements in confronting the uh, fossil fuel lock-in, the socio-environmental impacts of unconventional natural gas extraction and open pit coal mining, policy making connected to the Green New Deal, and just transition strategies for fossil fuel rich third world countries. Um, Importantly, Noel has been a contributing author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, the sixth annual, the sixth assessment uh, report with the chapter on mitigation and development pathways in the near to midterm. Uh, he was also appointed to the editorial board of the Energy Research and Social Sciences. And in 2015, he acted as an observer to the 2015 United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change talks in Bonn and uh, the 21 Paris talks. Uh, he's originally from Ireland, but he lives in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, he first came to the US in 2015 to study um, at UC Berkeley. Uh, he received his PhD at the National University of Ireland Galway in 2009 and is now an associate professor. Um, of Geography at Salem State University. It is a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you very much. So just checking, you guys can see my front slide. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to minimize myself. Okay. Um, delighted to be uh, here today as part of the Open Society University Network Economic Democracy Initiative. Uh, thank you, Pavlina, uh, for inviting me. Um, it's a, a great privilege to, to be here with students from all over the world, and, and hopefully my talk will um, be somewhat um, enlightening. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit of a mix of, of climate realism, doom and gloom, uh, but also going to talk about um, uh, some very exciting parts of, uh, of the climate movement. Um, so over the last two years, we've seen an explosion of Green New Deal proposals from across the globe, um, uh, from South Korea to Spain, to the UK, to the EU, um, and a sweep of Green New Deal-like proposals during the 2020 US presidential election and beyond. Um, as the Green New Deal and just transition policy and discourse rises in popularity uh, and shapes current and future um, climate and en energy policies, tracing both its history and future development is an important um, exercise. Um, so in today's talk, we'll focus on, on five key questions, um, which is a lot, but we have 45 minutes, so um, we, we've got time to, to get through all of these. Um, I'll begin by talking about why we first need radical climate action. So what is the climate emergency? Why do we need radical climate action? And what does radical mean? 
Um, second, I'll discuss why we need to democratize work after the pandemic. I'm sure this is a topic that you've covered in depth already in this course. Um, third, I'll analyze the contested framings of a just transition. Um, this is really important because there are now clear attempts to greenwash, water down, uh, and co-opt both just transition and Green New Deal movements. Um, I'll then move on to talking about what a radical Green New Deal looks like in practice uh, and why such conceptualizations are necessary to meet IPCC's 1.5 degree target. And throughout this, I'll offer a commentary on President Biden's climate plans, outlining some positive developments along with <laughs> some critical gaps of which there are many. Uh, so it's quite a, a US uh, centric talk, but towards the, the end, we'll talk about the gaps in terms of looking at the broader picture of how you deal with global climate justice on a, on a, on a national level. Okay, part one. So why do we need radical climate action? Um, unfortunately, this meme accurately encapsulates the national and international governmental response to the, to the climate emergency. This is despite the fact that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change outlined the magnitude of ongoing and future threats, extreme weather events, sea level rise, increased frequency and severity of droughts, floods and wildfires, the breakdown of food systems, mass human migration, uh, something that deeply concerns me, increased conflict and violence, um, here you can see some photos uh, just from last week. Uh, you saw New York City subways um, overwhelmed. Um, over 200 people lost their lives due to the uh, heat dome that hit the US Pacific um, Northwest. The UNFCCC, the UN, have sounded alarms on the existential threat that climate change poses. It's the defining issue of our time, an existential threat to our life and development. Study from The Lancet shows that climate change threatens 50 years of progress in global health. Um, even if you just look at uh, uh, air pollution impacts, so aside from climate change, air pollution from fossil fuels caused 8.7 million premature deaths in 2018. This is a staggering number. Um, so what we need is uh, the same level of transnational corporate um, uh, uh, collaboration and cooperation as we had during the, the COVID pandemic to tackle um, the climate crisis. So this graph here <laughs> gave me um, climate scientists, climate uh, concerned residents and citizens uh, uh, a lot of headaches and uh, sleepless nights. Um, effectively, and it, and it comes from the, the IPCC's 1.5 degree warming report. Um, global net CO2 emissions must fall by 45% of, as of 2030. So within a decade, we have to almost cut emissions in half. That's around 7.6% pollution cut every year. To put this in context, despite global efforts, emissions have risen every year over the past three years. And while there was an approximately 8.8% decrease in global emissions during the first six months of 2020 due to COVID lockdowns, and emissions are rebounding as global economies have opened. So this is, this is why Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and US Senator Ed Markey are scientifically accurate when they say that the age of incrementalism is over and now is the moment to take uh, to think big and take bold and urgent action. This is another quote from the IPCC where they stated that we must immediately institute rapid and far reaching transitions in energy, land, urban and infrastructure and industrial systems unprecedented in terms of, of scale. So this means effectively that we have to change everything. We have to reconstitute not only the electrical grid, but also the agricultural system, the transportation system, financial system, trade and manufacturing, land use, political system, military, and uh, the entire economy. Um, so we need transformative actions. Um, and we're at a very precarious moment within uh, the, the world's future and the actions that happen over the next you know, few weeks and months uh, are really critical. Okay. 
So that's part one, a kind of quick one-on-one into the climate emergency and what needs to happen. Uh, the second part, uh, and I won't go into too much detail here because you've covered a lot of this already um, in this course, is why democratize work after the pandemic? Well, the COVID pandemic has been on a unprecedented test in the government's ability to manage compound risks. So if you overlap all these crises together, um, effectively we're facing four interconnected crises. The COVID pandemic, a looming economic recession, uh, which is variable depending on which country you're in right now and your vaccine availability, extreme inequality, which is pretty much omnipresent, and a climate emergency. So robust global cooperation and governance with a human rights-centered approach, uh, which is supported by uh, appropriate legal and institutional frameworks is a prereq for successfully confronting these multi-dimensional overlapping challenges with integrated solutions. And when I talk about integrated solutions, uh, a Green New Deal is a classic example of an integrated solution, something that tackles actually existing inequalities and tries to address that in hand in hand with, with climate. Unfortunately, we're also facing all these other compound risks. So a new report from the World Economic Forum highlights persistent and emerging risks to human health, rising unemployment, widening digital divides, which became even more clear during a pandemic, youth disillusionment and geopolitical fragmentation. Um, as governments, businesses and societies grapple with COVID, societal cohesion is even more important um, than ever. Then on top of this, uh, we have all these racial justice disparities. A small proportion of the population has pocketed most of the new wealth. Um, and the coronavirus pandemic is laying bare the consequences of unequal distribution of prosperity. Uh, and this, this figure, these figures here from the Washington Post show the disparities between uh, white, Hispanic, black, Asian and uh, communities. You can see communities of color have been hit the hardest. Um, so there's uh, uh, a huge racial component to tackling both our unemployment crisis and also the impacts on um, uh, climate change impacts on, on communities of color, which I'll talk a little bit about later. We also have compound risks related to income inequality. So income inequality in the US is the highest of all G7 nations. Median black household income was around 61% of median white household income in 2018. The wealth gap between uh, the US's richest and poorest families more than doubled between 1989 uh, and 2016. Uh, and by most estimates, um, declining unionization accounts for about a third increase in equality between the 80s and 90s. And you can see here in this, this graph, um, there is a, a correlation of decline between union membership and a drop uh, in the share of income going to the to 10 percent okay so that's a, a quick uh, a summary of, of issues around labor which I know you've covered a lot but you can see the interconnecting um, crises and how the, the climate crisis and COVID has exacerbated all these okay so if you're still with me we're on to part three um, and I'm going to introduce the concept of a just transition and talk a little bit how this concept, why it's important and how it is being contested by, by different actors. So during the last several years, a just transition has merged from a concept largely known and contested by labor unions uh, to one that is now promoted and contested by unions, environmentalists, governments, cities, corporations, and so on. Um, its inclusion in the preamble of the 2015 Paris Accord signified its symbolic ascent into the heights of planetary politics uh, and governance. Um, so at a narrow level of focus on jobs, livelihoods, ensure that no one is left behind as we race to reduce emissions. So if you think about a coal miners, people working in the, in the fossil fuel industry. Um, but I, I, I'm going to show that we need to... Um, expand how we how we conceptualize just transition over the next few slides and a good way of looking at this is some great work which is done by the just transition research collaborative who 
do some of the, the best work on just transition, to show that different organizations frame just transition along um, uh, 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 different scopes from uh, a transformative version to uh, a more status quo. So there's different scales and scopes. Um, many of, of uh, uh, the tr more transformative examples of just transition have been rooted in local movements and community organizations uh, who have exerted pressure on local and regional and sometimes national governments to adopt alternative development strategies. Um, the definition, scope and scale of this concept range from a modest claims for green uh, for jobs in a green economy to a more radical and alternative global vision that replaces global extractive capitalism, expanding militarism and imperialism. So you can see there's, there's very broad and, uh, and narrow definitions uh, of a just transition. Um, this is a, the uh, Blue Climate Justice Alliance definition on the, on the top of the screen. Uh, it emerged through struggle and campaigning, not academia, which is generally a good thing. Um, you also have the US-based environmental network who argue that a just transition must confront a legacy of exploitation, ecocide, and environmental energy and climate and economic justice. Uh, just Transition is more mainstream in the US due to the work of EJ activists. It's a long history of EJ movements have, have pushed the concept and have played a key role in its, its conceptualization. Um, so Just Transition should benefit everyone impacted from workers whose livelihood does depend on dirty, harmful industries, so coal, oil and gas workers, for example, to communities whose local economy depend on these industries, uh, to communities who are harmed by these industries. But the important point I'd like to make is that we need to move beyond this scope. Um, so there's different configurations of scale and scope by which you can uh, conceptualize it. So we need to broaden just transition to address greater issues around gender equity, racial justice, and equity across all sectors. So just transition is broader than the energy sector. Um, there's a lack of research in the global uh, south, for example, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the different broader conceptualizations um, off the top of my head, some that need greater recognition is industrial agriculture, industrial food systems, migrant workers have thus far been almost completely ignored element of just transition. And these are also historically under, underrepresented by labor unions. Care work is now slowly getting the attention it deserves. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And on a grander scale, uh, a just transition could also be framed as an important part of climate reparations. We're looking at issues like um, um, climate justice on, on, on a global, le global level. Um, so now just transition is, has become mainstreamed. Um, over the past decade, uh, it has now been uh, mainstreamed within the United Nations through a range of other international and subnational policy frameworks. Uh, and the mainstreaming of the concept has led to some uh, stripping out of some of its radicalism, just like sustainability has lost its, uh, its original meaning. Um, here you have some very interesting quotes from the CEO of Anglo-American, uh, you know, large multinational uh, mining company. And you can see how they're, if you read the, the quote there, how they're twisting just transition and co-opting. So, Ironically, just transition is now becoming popular with obstructionists who frame it uh, just to protect jobs rather than meaningful climate action. Um, other countries just label existing uh, social welfare policies as, um, just, as a just transition. So um, avoiding the need to introduce new societal and safety nets. So governments are, are co-opting it a little. Um, we need to the re-radicalization of just transition politics and continue to expand and push back against uh, attempt, attempts to, to co-opt it. Um, okay, so what has happened at the international, national and, and local level? So there's a growing number of, of national commissions or task forces across the world. Um, Ireland has a just transition bill uh, appointed a Just Transition Commissioner to develop Just Transition for Peak Communities and Workers. Canada established a national task force to deal with the transition from coal for the whole of the country. Um, Colorado 
uh, decided to set up a just transition office to also transition from coal. Um, but in both cases, policies left out the major fossil uh, fuel sources of energy, natural gas in Colorado and tar sands in Canada. Um, Spain's just transition plan for coal miners um, should be commended, includes early retirement redundancy packages, retraining for green jobs and priority job placement uh, for miners. Um, the EU has set up a just transition mechanism for part of its Green Deal. UK and Ireland have a Build Back Better campaign for green and just uh, recovery. Moving down to the local level, you have places like Yorkshire Low Carbon Task Force or New York, the New Roots Coalition, which offered a, a, a truly radical climate policy within the US and coupled climate justice with, with EJ uh, components. Um, Hopefully everyone can still hear me. I can't see anyone, but um, please shout if, if there's any issues. Okay, so we're moving on um, to the next one now. Okay, so now we're moving on to a Green New Deal. Um, you probably have heard of the Green New Deal on some level, uh, and I'm just gonna give you a quick introduction to some of the important uh, components. But before I get to that, I'll tell you why we, why we have failed thus far. So for nearly three decades, governments have been trying to find climate solutions that do not clash with free market orthodoxies of deregulation, privatization, low taxes for the rich and public austerity. Um, energy transitions that narrowly focus on carbon reduction won't address endemic inequality and energy poverty. Um, for example, the Yellow Vest protests, the photo here on the screen in France, the 2019 mass public revolts in Chile, uprisings in Ecuador, Haiti were sparked by fuel taxes, rise in public transportation costs and cuts to fossil fuel subsidies. A Green New Deal should be grounded in a just transition framework which provides a suite of climate policies that have a redistributive outcome such as the Green New Deal's job guarantee. So this is a, a screenshot from my paper in Energy Research and Social Science with Ray Galvin, um, where we uh, investigated Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal and the Green New Deal resolution. Um, so what is a Green New Deal? Okay, <laughs> depending on who you, you talk to, you get a lot of different definitions, but I'll try and simplify. It's a 10-year economic mobilization plan to rapidly transition the US to a zero carbon economy, while at the same time significantly addressing and reducing inequality and redressing legacies of systematic oppression. I mean, that's fantastic. Um, that's the type of policies that we need. Um, it's a reasonable, pragmatic to the climate crisis, despite what uh, naysayers might say. It aims to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions through a fair and just transition for all communities and workers, create millions of good high wage jobs and ensure prosperity for all people of the United States. The Green New Deal is perhaps best thought of as a, a governing agenda that guides every aspect of public policy making. It rejects mainstream neoliberalism economics uh, and its economic rationale is based on the adoption of a Keynesian demand side economics, um, similar to the type used by President FDR to revitalize the economy during the Great Depression in 1930. Um, in the midst of a pandemic and a climate emergency, we desperately need policies that match the nature, scale and urgency of these crises. And if Green New Deal, if done right, can establish these urgent public health and economic safety nets to protect the most vulnerable and starve off dangerous climate change. Um, and the Green New Deal as a concept is far more radical than a just transition because it encapsulates all the different scopes of a just transition and the actually existing inequalities that already exist. Um, this is an important point. So most people mistakenly think the Green New Deal is just gonna be one bill that's gonna get blocked. Well, uh, it should instead be seen as uh, not just one single piece of legislation, but rather a roadmap for a broad spectrum of policies, programs, legislations, and executive actions that can be introduced by various US representatives and senators over the coming decade. So we have to think on a, on a much grander scale here. Um, here are a list of existing legislations which encapsulate the umbrella of a Green New Deal, AOC's and Sanders Green New Deal for public housing, 
um, Green New Deal for Cities, End Polluter uh, Welfare Act, the Bill Green Act, all the way down to the Agricultural Resilience Act. So it's going to be a, an umbrella or a nest of different uh, policies. So what, what exactly are the, the mechanics of a Green New Deal or what is it trying to achieve? Well, first, it's trying to reject mainstream economics. Uh, one of its key targets is to undo the inequalities generated in part by neoliberalism, uh, the prevailing global policy model predicated by free market capitalism and privatization. It represents a systematic response to a systems crisis. And importantly, it represents the clearest effort yet uh, to forge a politics that tackles climate change and inequality simultaneously. And Matthew Huber um, has, has written a lot of fantastic stuff about this. The Green Jobs Programme is an example that, for example, could finally break the jobs versus environment debate, which has hindered the acceptance of climate policy for decades. Um, not only does the Green New Deal aim to revolutionize energy and the economic system, but importantly, it offers clear and direct benefits to mass to the mass of working class by calling for popular social programs such as a federal job guarantee, which I'm, I know you've covered, millions of high paying jobs, expanded trade, tra trade union rights, enhanced health care, etc. Okay, so we did climate crisis, employment crisis, uh, what is the Green New Deal, what is a just transition, and now I'm going to show how these all are integrated um, together within the Green New Deal movement and why um, the Green New Deal has, has catapulted discussions or, or of just transition to a new level. So it's important to reground the Green New Deal by chase, uh, 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 tracing its origins. So FDR didn't just fix the economy, arguably he saved democracy itself. It was bigger than just a recovery program. You can trace the concept of just transition really um, to the end of World War II when the government took steps to provide education, home loan, unemployment benefits to cushion the return of 16 million uh, servicemen and women to civilian life. life. Um, the public sphere needs to be broadened, um, so which is not the same as enhancing the power of the state, as Stevens and others um, uh, write about. Uh, rather, the goal is a more egalitarian and de democratic uh, eco-social state and society. So, just uh, a job guarantee and just transition. So now we're getting into the kind of the thick of things of, of different policy proposals that are that are. Um, materialized during the 2020 US presidential election and, and also some uh, proposals from the Biden administration. Um, arguably, uh, a, just, uh, a job guarantee is one of the most important components of, it, of a Green New Deal. A public sector job guarantee can serve as an ongoing shock absorber and a powerful tool for economic um, stabilization. It's a viable policy option for tackling both unemployment and underemployment. Um, for instance, Congresswoman Coleman and, and Congresswoman Omar introduced a Workforce uh, Promotion uh, and Access Act, and this proposal called for the U.S. Department of Labor to establish a job guarantee for states, localities, and tribal entities where unemployment rate is greater than 10% or double the national unemployment rate. Um, good news is that public support for job guarantee has been high even before the crisis with approval ratings of um, up to 78% among US voters. A large scale implementation of job guarantee would be the single most significant transformation of labor since the advent of modern labor markets. Um, we can also apply just transition to other sectors. For instance, Bernie Sanders mentioned the just transition for healthcare workers. So, if, I mean, uh, if we switch and rightly switch to Medicare for all, then the healthcare industry is going to need a just transition. Um, Alyssa, Alyssa Battistoni at Harvard writes a lot of really important stuff of, of the need to recognize care work, um, which is low carbon work, which, is, which can be expanded uh, uh, as much as possible. Uh, but it's important also not to limit this to policies um, uh, to uh, re recognizing uh, the informal work. Um, because if we limit policies to formal employment, um, this will mean omitting uh, women and workers in the formal and uh, care economies, largely women and immigrants. Uh, so care work is, is climate work, and that is something that a lot of people have to 
uh, expander, I mean, all policies, all politics now are climate politics. Um, when you link it back to the first part of my talk, when you talked about the need to transform everything. Um, okay. Labor is directly linked to, to our, our, our climate uh, future. Um, the PRO Act was a major piece uh, of labor legislation that already passed the House. Um, on the, on the left-hand side of the screen there, you can see some of the, the key, um, uh, uh, key components of it. Uh, while it was good that Biden um, came out in support of the PRO Act, um, he didn't, he could have done a lot more. I mean, Biden supports the PRO Act, but he refused to use his executive authority to deliver two promised rules to deter uh, the kind of corporate union busting that Amazon used, for example, the persuader rule and the, the neutrality rule. Um, Biden, uh, I mean, a, a US president should use their bully pulpit to build a political will for a more transformative vision like FDR. Um, so at the moment, any comparison between Biden and FDR is uh, doesn't exactly uh, work, um, but he can uh, use these executive actions and, and, and leverages for, for good. Um, if you're looking at the, the narrow, so if you're kind of looking at the bread and butter just transition, the, the, the ones that are often more associated with fossil fuel uh, dependent communities, what types of schemes are needed? Well, income retraining and relocation support for workers facing uh, retrenchment, guaranteeing the pension for workers affected. So Spanish Greek, um, Just Transition Plan was quite good at this. Mounting effective transition programs for fossil fuel dependent communities, strong government support, dedicated funding streams, diverse and strong coalitions, uh, economic di uh, diversification, um, uh, and it needs to be proactive rather than reactive. I mean, uh, you don't need to be a rocket scientist or a climate scientist to see that we need uh, that change is coming or change should come really rapidly. And uh, um, we also need to change uh, framing climate change as a public uh, crisis. Um, or framing climate change as a public crisis also requires us to transform energy itself from a commodity to a public good. Um, so the struggle can't just be conceived as merely one issue or sector called energy. The seeding of our energy system to the market is part of a broader neoliberal um, economy that privileges the private over collective solutions to the basics of life, health, energy, housing, and even for some water. Um, so if we are to meet 1.5 degree target, we must begin by recuperating our basic notions of public and collective against the, the ruthless um, privatism and, uh, uh, of market um, logic. So there has been proposals that fit, broadly speaking, into these types of transformative vision. Uh, Ray Galvin uh, of Cambridge, myself, this is uh, the, the, the infographic on the left is from our, our study, which um, um, was also appeared in, uh, in the journal Jewel. Um, a write-up of it, uh, Sanders represented the most transformed uh, proposal of the 2020 climate plans. Um, and what does a transformative approach mean? Well, it means something that is moving towards upend neoliberal economics, is pushing back against austerity politics, pushing back against deregulation, undoing what Trump did, but going beyond that, tackling corporate monopolies and unequal distributions of power and wealth. And these are all linked, uh, these are all climate issues. Uh, Sanders' uh, uh, Green New Deal was uh, important because it illustrated a reinvigorated welfare state, it promoted litigation against fossil fuel industry is very strong on, on supply side cl climate, which I'm going to talk about, green public spaces. But importantly, it was an internationalist Green New Deal. And this is something that didn't really get much recognition. Um, it adopted a fair shares approach um, uh, by setting aside 200 billion for the Green Climate Fund or um, for the Global South. Uh, so his proposal. Um, effectively amounted to 161% reduction by 2030 when you take into account um, the support for, um, for uh, uh, third world countries. 
And that is something that didn't appear in other plans and is unfortunately the missing link from most, uh, from most climate plans. It's also important to acknowledge, acknowledge that including racial justice and economic justice uh, is really important uh, within climate. And you get a lot of naysayers talking about this. For example, if you increase the tax rate on the highest incomes by just a few percent, redistribute the proceeds to the poorest households, this would significantly reduce CO2 emissions. Building new low carbon housing can act as a decarbonizing lever for the building sector, which contributes around 40% to um, energy consumption. Um, emissions of poor and households are often disproportionately high, uh, and we need working class and climate movement for big cuts, so we need to get them on board. Uh, so tackling uh, historic uh, oppression is, is hugely important. Okay, um, this is the final uh, uh, part of my presentation where I go into a little bit more narrowly focused on, on Biden's climate plans um, and to see whether they match the scale and scope of the climate emergency. Unfortunately, you all know the simple answer to this, but there is still some hope uh, if, if um, progressive politicians and social movements can keep pushing him. So the first thing we have to talk about is how do you pay for a Green New Deal? How do you pay for a just transition? These big public policy programs akin to what we had during FDR period. Um, and this again is my study with Ray Galvin, where we looked at uh, Sanders' $16.3 trillion uh, Green New Deal. So Congress approved a $2.2 trillion COVID aid, aid package, right? the largest in US modern history. And all of a sudden, the how will you pay for question uh, disappeared from public discourse or took on a whole um, uh, new level of interest. Uh, paying for the Green New Deal is actually easy. The challenge is the political will. We can pay for a Green New Deal the same way we pay for the COVID aid package um, or the same way we pay for U US military budgets, foreign wars or Trump's $2.3 trillion tax bill. Congress authorizes the necessary spending, the Treasury spends it. Within the COVID aid package, there are no pay fors, as in there are no offsets to make a deficit neutral. Um, many economists no longer see rising government debt as a problem in the same way as they used to. This debt obsession has been carefully debunked by economic uh, research. High public debt has not led to rising interest rates. Um, our study found that Sanders' $16.3 trillion Green New Deal was both pragmatic and economically credible. Um, the cost of an action is, of course, far greater, something that is often, you know, not considered. What happens if we do nothing? The, the cost is in the multiple of trillions, and there's a stream of studies on this. So there is fiscal space. What is needed is the political will. Um, and beyond the, the, the 2020 climate cycle, there has been other proposals, such as the one proposed by uh, Sunrise and others, progressives led by Senator Ed Markey, and, and Representative Debbie Dingell announced a 10 trillion counter proposal to the White House plan called the Tribe Act, uh, which would pump nearly $1 trillion a year into green infrastructure and the care economy. So there's a lot of proposals sitting around there. When you're talking about a just transition and the Green New Deal, we have to talk about supply side climate policy. So supply side climate policy means fossil fuel bans, moratoriums, anything that curbs the production of fossil fuel, okay? These actions directly uh, challenge the, the political and economic power of fossil fuel industry. So within days of taking office, um, there was some good news. Biden revoked the Keystone Pipeline permit, froze new oil and gas leasing on federal lands uh, and offshore waters and committed to a review of existing fossil fuel leases. However, recently the Biden administration announced it would allow oil to continue and flow through the, the quota access pipeline, despite promises uh, to listen to tribes and take environmental climate justice ser seriously. Uh, what do we need to do? Well, Congress needs to pass the End the Polluter Welfare Act, which would eliminate all federal subsidies and financial support for fossil fuel production. It could reinstate the crude oil ban, prohibit export of coal and li liquefied gas, ban fracking on federal lands, reject federal permits for any fossil fuel infrastructure, including the Dakota Access Pipeline, Line 3, 
mountain valley pipelines. And these are necessary to meet 1.5 degree targets. And these are hugely popular. Um, if you have strong just transition policies for fossil fuel dependent communities, you can do all these uh, important and necessary climate actions. Bringing it back to the climate science, uh, one really important study I just plucked from, from Nature, uh, the Tom study showed that, that 1.5 degree carbon budgets, budgets allow for no new emitting infrastructure. So in other words, not only should no new fossil fuel using infrastructure be built, some existing power plants need to be shut down early. So existing fossil fuel plants alone will push the world across a dangerous limit, even without new planned, newly planned fossil fuel installations. One big debate that's happening now is uh, over the climate, um, civilian climate corps. Biden's 10 billion plan proposal to create 20,000 jobs annually. Uh, this isn't enough. Uh, FDR employed 300,000 people per year. Uh, for example, the National Park Service alone has an estimated 12 billion deferred maintenance backlog. So 10 million is not going to go far. Uh, when thinking back to my first few slides and the needs for big transformative actions, and this is something that the Sunrise Movement, AOC and Markey and others who have proposed a 1.5 million strong climate uh, corps uh, uh, as a new part of the Green New Deal. And this is something that the Senate and Congress are now trashing out in the Reconciliation Infrastructure Bill and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. Um, so, as, as I said, uh, this is currently something that's been, been trashed about. You have the Republicans who are trying to block um, everything. You have some uh, more conservative Democrats who are looking for a bipartisan bill. You've then got other progressive Democrats who are looking for a more climate realism approach and also pushing a reconciliation bill in conjunction with a, a, a bipartisan bill. Um, so on the one hand, the two million infrastructure package, President Biden introduced marks the most significant federal climate investment to date. Okay, historically speaking, yes, this sounds great. But um, Biden's job plan is tied directly to revenue raising or what folks in DC call pay for, so offsets or savings from other government programs. Um, uh, so deficit politics are still getting in the way of building a, a more sustainable and resilient economy that works for all. I mean, we can still introduce a wealth tax, but we, we don't need it to fund all these. Uh, so just like the New Deal, we need to spend at the scale demanded by the climate emergency and take care of the funding when the macroeconomic balance sheet dictates it. Uh, the investment in deep decarbonization will require, require multiple trillions of dollars. Uh, and these neoclassical economic assumptions um, must be challenged. And our last, our last, our second last slide, okay. So there was a lot of uh, celebration uh, when Biden pledged to slash greenhouse gas emissions by half by 2030, okay? Um, but unfortunately, when you look at a number of, of other factors, this isn't as uh, good or progressive as it sounds. The US is the largest historical contributor to climate change. It has a responsibility and capacity to commit to a fair share target, which was introduced by EJ and international development groups. Um, so 50% does not meet the US fair shares of 195% reductions. So that would be 70% domestic reductions and 125 through international support. Um, so this is something that, that, uh, that Bernie considered during his plan. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of, uh, of, I mean, climate knows no uh, borders uh, and um, the big gap, and I, I'm willing to talk about um, the need for a global uh, Green New Deal and the question time as well. Um, and there's a lot of things that we can, we can tease out there. But some concluding comments. Um, it's clear that markets cannot work alone. Okay, if we are going to tackle the climate emergency, we cannot be dependent on markets. Okay, so this failed strategy for the last three decades has to change. The Green New Deal is a long-term 
uh, plan for political change. So decades or multi, multiple decades. Emissions reductions is a political project. We need to look at bans, fossil fuel moratoriums, okay? There won't be a win-win solution to the climate, okay? There has to be some losers in it. And the losers should be fossil fuel industry who have misled uh, and uh, uh, misled the public for mul multiple decades around the threats of climate change and the risk caused by their product. Um, Structural change needs to be managed. Okay, we need direct state intervention, a more egalitarian state. We need massive reconfigurations of power, looking at um, uh, all elements of, of governance uh, at a federal level and, and international level. Uh, we need to phase out fossil fuels and technologies, hugely important. We need targeted interventions in infrastructure, public services, urban and regional planning, uh, deficit spending within the US um, and a, a currency issue, issuing countries has to, to be a part of this. Taxing the rich and, you know, a wealth tax is hugely popular um, uh, and, it, and it can work. Foreign policy has to change. We have to move away from protectionist view on renewables um, just in the same way we need to uh, tear up the, um, the IP for, for COVID vaccines. We need to move away from this protectionist view on renewables and the idea of competing with China. I mean, um, we need an international coordinated resp uh, response. One, um, I don't want to say easy fix, but a hugely import important one is debt relief for the global south. How can any country in the global south um, tackle climate change? They're uh, far more vulnerable than first world countries. Uh, how can they deal with climate adaptation, resilience, um, uh, climate disaster preparedness and response? Um, debt relief from the global south has to be a part of the international discussions around the global Green New Deal. And all politics now are climate politics. Um, um, it, it's, it's no good talking about climate solutions um, you know, within the Department of Environment or solely within the Department of Energy. I mean, labor, agriculture, um, healthcare, they're all linked now. And I think that's the final message that, that I will leave is that all politics are now climate politics. Um, and hopefully this, this talk was, was helpful in, in <laughs> looking at how interconnected everything is. Uh, uh, but also identifying that there are uh, uh, strategies for hope, particularly around Green New Deal and these big public policies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Noel, so very much uh, for the most important, for highlighting the most important issue before us. Um, I. Uh, there are just so many, there are so many questions. I'm sure the students, uh, the students have them. So please um, raise your hand, unmute yourself, use the chat function and I will moderate them. But I want to maybe start off the discussion on, as you very clearly have described the interconnectedness of the issues that uh, we are not able to solve one piece of this puzzle without thinking broadly and comprehensively about political economy issues, issues of power, deficit politics, um, technical issues, and most importantly, the justice aspect. Um, where do you find the most um, effective strategy to move forward in, with aggressive action. I mean, you outlined how there is the areas of hope and there are, you know, bolder visions that we had seen previously. But where do you find the most kind of uh, promising venue for making global change? Um, so, well, I, I guess within, if I start within the US, um, Unfortunately, it boils down to a lot of things like getting rid of the filibuster <laughs> and tackling with the Joe Manchin issue. Um, it, it's horrible to think that one 
democratic uh, uh, senator could um, has so much power in blocking um, what could be a once in a lifetime opportunity to kickstart a, a, a global uh, Green New Deal response. Um, but unfortunately, it, 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 that's where we need to, to first start. Um, uh, and I think that uh, the Biden administration, if they really wanted to flex their muscles, they could twist um, uh, Joe Manchin's uh, hand on this. Uh, and I think to date, we haven't seen Biden uh, uh, flex his muscles in terms of executive actions and do those uh, uh, kind of political deals that need to be done to, to, to open that space for big public uh, spending. So I would say the, the first thing is the dirty politics, so to speak, within the US. That has to be done. And it can be done. Um, the, the, the president and, 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 and others, when they want to get things done, they can, they can get things done. Um, so the political will and also social movements. Staying within the US still, I, I, so the Sunrise Movement has done an amazing job and probably have been the most effective political climate political um, uh, uh, group within the US. I mean, when they, they um, occupied Nancy Pelosi's office at the start of this Green New Deal discussion. I think we've hit a new phase now where I think more types of direct action and disruptive politics uh, must take place. Um, so I would like to see a second phase of disruptive politics to take place now under the Biden administration. Um, Thirdly, within the US, and, and I mean, a lot of your works uh, aligns with this, is the issue of deficit politics and how we need to push back uh, against this fear mongering around deficit spending. And um, I mean, I think that can really open up uh, a lot of scope for tackling our, you know, funding issues in agriculture and infrastructure and transportation, all these sectors that need to get challenged. At a more international level, um, what's really needed is, so the IPCC's <coughs> um, uh, or the UNFCCC's Paris Agreement and others, I view them more as the background music. Okay, they're really important, they set important goals, but they're not going far enough because with, with um, or during the, the climate talks, for the most part, nation states are proxies for fossil fuel interest. So it's always going to be lowest common denominator because it needs a hundred percent agreement for anything to go into the text. Okay, if it needs a hundred percent agreement, it's always going to be lowest common denominator. So I see the the a greater role for individual Green New Deal um, uh, proposals coming out through different countries, but also uh, uh, more initiatives that are bringing countries together to tackle issues like um, uh, debt relief with, fan, uh, with financial packages, integration of just transition within, within um, G20 talks, um, et cetera. Um, but like debt relief is something that is really important at the international level. I would rank that up there as being one of the most important. That's a really interesting point that uh, countries can deploy their own sovereignty to lead uh, while we are still engaged in this global conversation. I mean, it is just so stunning that we were able to find consensus on the global minimum corporate tax. And that is like, you know, at the top of the policy agenda at the international level, but we're not like pushing for this kind of consensus on some of these climate questions. Um, any questions from our students and guests. Uh, Kailin, I see you, but I, I don't see everyone else. So please also use the raise hand function. Go ahead, Kailin. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the like relationship between the advocacy with the Sunrise Movement and sort of people power plans and just like that general people power um, and policy. Like does the advocacy shape the policy? Um, does the policy come first and the advocates are the ones that have the like momentum and political, I don't know, finesse to get it through? Like, what does that relationship look like? Yeah, the, I mean, the, for me, that's the most interesting thing that's happening right now is 
is how do social movements, group like Sunrise and, and uh, movements for Black Lives and others are creating all these new solidarities and, and connections and trying to lobby um, uh, DC. I, I think the, the important thing that has to happen is these groups need to keep organizing and keep evolving. I think their missions and their tactics need to change. Um, have to be in the streets um, uh, demanding a Green New Deal from elected officials up and down the ballot, uh, primarying democratic candidates who don't support the Green New Deal. This was really effective. And I think this has to continue to be a central uh, tactic. Pushing back against corporate polluters being represented in the cabinet. Uh, personnel is policy. This is really important, you know, um, uh, making sure that they don't have those fossil fuel ties. Um, but creating millions of you, like one of the most fantastic things the Sunrise Movement did was they changed the narrative uh, around creating millions of union jobs while building a clean economy. And I mean, this is a winning argument. Um, uh, uh, guilting someone for using a plastic straw or something is not okay you know we need collective actions we need to talk about creation of millions of, of jobs and democrats are slowly coming around to this idea uh, and in part because of the the push by grassroots um activism i mean the democrats still don't have a spine to to, to actually go to bat for any of these things but my hope is that as social movements change tactics as you have this new cohort of, of progressive politicians um, that we can build a type of politics and solidarities to create win-win uh, for citizens and res residents to create millions of unionized jobs, okay? So I think that Sunrise and other movements have done fantastic in not only crafting their own policy, pushing legislators, you know, being in the ear of all these progressives, um, but we probably need a mix up of tactics as well with, with social movements at the same time. Okay, Kaylin uh, was joining us from Brooklyn and Max is joining us from Taiwan. Go ahead, Max. Um, hi, uh, Dr. Uh, Huey. So I got a question. So as um, nations that execute supply side policies, there is the possibility that um, these nations, they probably would just outsource these uh, pollutions and emissions to other countries that pass not so strict uh, emission policies. And well, these carbon emissions, to, like, I mean, these policy probably wouldn't would reduce these carbon emissions, but kind of just ship them to other countries resulting in like, uh, a uh, global carbon emission not like reducing. So I want to ask like in your opinion, is there any way to prevent this kind of thing from happening from not reducing the global carbon emission but just shifting to other countries? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, and um, there, there's a, first I'll point you to some literature um, done by the Stockholm Environment Institute. So Peter Erickson, um, uh, and others have actually tackled this specific question because it's one of the, the kind of criticisms of, of supply side, you know, what happens if, if, if other countries just outsource, outsource it. Um, uh, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember the exact argument that they, they use to, to counteract this. It's a brilliant question, but I can't. Uh, I know that like you have to add in extra stipulations. I mean, outsourcing your pollute, it's no good for California to ban, you know, um, fracking and coal plants, et cetera, if they're going to start importing your um, coal from Colombia, for example. Um, so uh, I can give you a local example of, 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 of this. Um, in Salem, uh, uh, where I teach, there was a coal plant um, and the, coal was imported from Colombia. Um, so they shut down the coal plant and there was a lot of, of, of uh, fanfare over the reduction in emissions of, of coal. But they then um, uh, converted it to a natural gas station. But actually, if you look at the life cycle uh, emissions around natural gas, it's actually worse than coal over a 20 year timeline. Um, in situ, the emissions around Salem uh, were reduced, but the life cycle emissions uh, were elongated. Um, so 
Yeah, so this is a really important question and, and I can find the, the studies that tackle this and I can, I can get, um, I can email them to you after the class and I need to brush up on, <laughs> on, on, that, on that area. Thanks, Max. Thank you. Other questions? Students and guests. Uh, I will carry on with uh, with another. Um, no, how are you understanding um, the differences in approaches uh, here in the U.S. versus in the Green Deal in Europe? And in your assessment, you know, where are the, some of the commonalities and what are some of the differences? Yeah. So what's really interesting is that there is. Uh, I mean, there's a, there there. Is, Myself and Fergus Green have a, a paper that's under review and we documented around, around 30 or so Green New Deals that are, have been proposed um, on a global level. Uh, and there's a few different types of categories. So you had the cohort that came about during the 2020 presidential election. You had you have the EU Green New Deal, which is very much an ecological modernization approach. It doesn't have, I mean, it has um, some good just transition stuff, but uh, it still has that more kind of traditional climate policy approach. One Green New Deal proposal that was just seemed to tick most of the boxes was the Green New Deal for Europe proposal. And that was created by a cohort of academics and climate and labor groups across Europe. Uh, and that really um, uh, covered a lot of areas which are neglected around um, the need for an international Green New Deal, uh, tackling the <laughs> tricky issues around consumption and degrowth, which is a very contested, uh, cont contested subject, uh, and also issues around um, um, wealth taxes uh, and others. Um, there's been other proposals in, from social groups in the UK, in Spain, um, in France, um, the ones that were, are probably the most interesting and, and mo most scientifically uh, realistic are the ones that emerge from the Global South, uh, Latin American uh, and the Red New Deals, because they tackle these more true understandings of, of where the climate problem came from in terms of historical emissions, the role of colonialism and imperialism. Um, so the Red New Deals, there's a Latin American pact which deals with all these thorny international issues around trade. And, and that is something which I, I do see the Green New Deal discussion shifting towards. It's shifting towards a more globalized um, um, uh, understandings. And actually, just before I got on, I saw a tweet that Congresswoman um, Omar, um, folks from the Labour movement or the Labour Party in the UK and, and a few other um, um, international leaders are working on this new Green New Deal group, uh, which I, I think is really uh, uh, exciting. Um, so I think we're in a really exciting era, as depressing as the whole climate emergency is, because the Green New Deal, I think, is the first time that discussions are happening on the scale and the scope of the crisis. And up until now, we were just talking about narrow carbon taxes. Um, so we're at an exciting moment, um, but, it's going to take a whole lot of people power to 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 bring it to the scale needed. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, do you find uh, the conversation on climate reparations uh, is significant in the global north, or primarily from coming from the Red uh, New Deal? And and do you see the climate reparations as um, kind of a leading issue? climate issue or do you see it as a kind of remedial you know we need to pay our dues or are they you know are they just in inherently intertwined those two yeah i mean i, I would say that it, to date it hasn't taken up much space within global north discussions and only recently in the last probably year or so i, I see a new kind of interjection of 
the need for a, a fair shares approach. I think that that, you know, that the, the, the trade and, and climate groups that are working on that um, have interjected a new um, urgency to, to recognize uh, historical emissions. Um, and it, I mean, the US has released more global warming than any other country and remains the uh, world's second highest emitter. So China's the highest, but China has four times the population. So what we really need to, to focus on is a few things. So what is the remaining carbon budget? Um, what is the responsibility of, of the countries who have emitted? What is the capabilities? Uh, and then you have the country's right to develop sustainably. Um, and that's the common but differentiated responsibility. Um, and I think that uh, it's the hardest question. I mean, it's what has blocked the UNFCCC talks all the time, you know, common but differentiated responsibilities. This is the same as, as reparations. Um, and maybe, it might, I mean, it might be good to think about on different scales. Uh, for instance, in Ireland, um, Ireland imported this coal from Colombia, where I do a, a lot of my work looking at displacement of indigenous peoples. And the Irish government was looking to divest from Cerro Home coal mine and issue an apology. And I was kind of cringing at the thought of the indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities receiving an apology from the Irish people. I mean, an apology means nothing. They, they should get material, you know, they should get paid for the suffering, okay? So I think that uh, discussions around reparations has to happen at different levels. It can't, I mean, obviously the most important is like the US should be giving, um, I, I think that the, the fair shares group called for 800 billion in international climate finance and that to be split among finance for mitigation, adaptation uh, and the loss and damage caused by an irreversible climate uh, change. And that's like a, a good faith down payment towards the US fair shares. But I think we should also start looking at it at the local level if that's possible, um, because we need to start uh, normalizing the issue of reparations and restorative justice, because we need to deal with our, with, our, with our past. And of course, that is tricky. I think out of all the climate challenges, that's the, the, the thorniest of them all. Um, um, but but I'm excited to see what see what happens in this area because it's moving fast. Yeah, thanks. I see a question from Nawid, and I know some of our students have connectivity issues, so they might not be able to ask them in person. Please use the chat function. Um, Nawid, I am trying to understand exactly your question. When do we move to lower carbon technologies and sources of energy that plans are taken into consideration? Or what plans, okay, what plans are taken into consideration to protect workers' rights, protect some of the poorest and more, most vulnerable groups in society? I think that the question pertains specifically to plans taken to uh, protect workers' rights. Um, what are some of these yeah. st steps? Um, well, I guess that, that um, in, in the US context, so we have the, the, the PRO Act. Um, and that, if I can see on the, I'll just get my thing here to show the key. Okay, so the key parts of the, of the PRO Act were, what slide is it on? Okay, within the US. So to streamline union contract processes, ban replacing striking workers, prevents the misclassification of employees as independent contractors, legalize secondary boycotts and, and bans the right to work laws currently in effect in more than half the states. So within the US, we, um, uh, the passing of the PRO Act would just completely transform the labor environment add in all these protections for workers. Um, and as workers are, the more precarious they are, the, the less involved they are in, in society because they're trying to figure out how am I going to pay for my next bill, okay? So I would say in the, in, in the, in the US, the PRO Act is something that has to happen. Um, on an international level or just in terms of, of uh, in fossil fuel communities, I mean, 
what the Spanish government did was really impressive uh, in terms of their protections uh, for, for coal mining workers. Um, so each country um, has to implement new provisions for fossil fuel dependent communities. But then on the larger scale, I mean, working towards a Green New Deal is essentially a labor bill. It's a labor and climate bill. So I would see that pushing for, um, for uh, a Green New Deal type proposals will add these additional safety nets for, uh, for workers. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Hamid uh, from Afghanistan is asking, what is the role of the private sector in this transition as the states uh, should work in policy implementation? That's the, a, yeah. Role, yeah, the role of the private versus the state. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So, um, so deep decarbonization at the scale required requires massive investments in, in energy, transport, agriculture, infrastructure networks. Um, financial resources must be committed to match the scale of ambition uh, until a new level of, of climate equilibrium is, is reached. Um, so this requires transforming uh, agriculture industry buildings, transport energy, these, these key areas. Um, and it's going to take massive investments. The private uh, community or private investment uh, still can play an important role. I mean, we still need innovation and technologies and, and all that. But I think it, it has to come um, from the state. The state is really the only actor that can operate um, at the scale uh, at the scale needed uh, to tackle a climate uh, a crisis. I mean, FDR did create a, a system whereby private enterprise was able to flourish as well, but it needs that, that uh, state level steering to get us out of the crisis. Uh, I think that's really important. And it will then create all these other markets, but the state has to steer, um, uh, but in a egalitarian or eco-social state uh, uh, perspective, which people like Stavis and others have, have written about. Um, so private investment is important, but I would, I would prioritize the, the state first. Yeah, the, the power, not just the vision and the mission, and the, um, but the power of procurement, the power of the public purse that can muster resources on shorter in ways that the private sector can't. Um, but uh, yeah, establishing the labor standards too, to in the you know ecological standards. Um, there was a we discussed an article that was um, came out in the Financial Times uh, just yesterday, I think, on that the Green New Deal requires nothing short of central planning, global at the global level. And um, uh, okay, Max, uh, you have one more question. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So I got another question. No, so I really love one hard question, Max. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, um, if developing nations want to implement a plan, a program such as the Green New Deal, uh, in your opinion, what would be the most important thing for them to overcome if they want to succeed? Yeah, that's my question. So, it's so each each country is different. So, for instance when you're looking at Green New Deal for Europe, I mean, most countries in Europe have strong social safety nets, like Ireland, the UK, free healthcare, free education, more or less um, uh, un unemployment that you can uh, live uh, quite comfortably on. Um, so the Green New Deal within uh, uh, these countries isn't as focused on these social safety nets as much. If you come to the US, social safety nets seem radical uh, because we don't have social safety nets. So then in, in, in third world countries, global south, the, it's complex, it's, it's country by country. For instance, in Colombia, where I, I spend a lot of time, they have free healthcare. Okay, I mean, the healthcare system has problems, but they actually have free healthcare. And you know, uh, a, a lot of third world countries also have free education. So the first answer would be it's country dependent. The second is that the funding for this should be uh, in part provided by first world countries um, because 
uh, or a second way of looking at, at it is uh, uh, third world debt. If that is cancelled, then instead of countries putting millions and billions of dollars back into unfair trading uh, systems, which are set or established um, using colonial frameworks, that they can instead leapfrog into a clean energy economy. And it's very hard to do that without, because they've got all these systematic obstacles in front of them. And I, I think that canceling global debt is, is hugely important. And also, um, if you look at how the intellectual property rights for COVID has, has um, shackled so many countries' ability to come out of this pandemic, the same can be said for intellectual property rights around clean energy. Um, you can make a similar argument around trade rules, IP rights, uh, so that we have a sharing of technologies because we're, we're, we're all in this together. Climate knows no, no boundaries. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Anna, if you can unmute yourself. Good morning, Professor, and thank you so much for today's lecture and presentation. It was very wonderful to know about energy saving and its project. I have a question regarding like, because as I read in, in the paper, like we should use low carbon dioxide or low chemical products in order to, to protect our climate. But I have a question, even in industrialized countries such as Japan and Germany and other ind industrialized countries, they use so many like uh, chemical products, then how we can protect the climate if we live in that country or how we can make different projects in order to protect the environment in industrialized countries. Because as we know, like those countries that they are not industrialized, so they don't have that much pollution or they don't have, have that much polluted air. But when we are living in an industrialized country, so so every day they're like, they're the product, the pollutes, the, the air and the environment. Yeah. So, I mean, uh... So pollution is, is, is a huge problem. And I had that stat, I think it's 8.2 million people die per year from fossil fuel pollutants. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the, or if you look at, at, at everything that, that China produces, most of this is going to the US and, and first world countries. So we've uh, externalized our pollution to third world countries. Um, and I think this also has to be taken into account at the UNFCCC level in terms of um, embodied emissions. So that is one thing that, that needs to be tackled. Um, one thing that was a, a silver lining for a, a minuscule silver lining of the COVID crisis was that air quality improved in, in major cities across the world. And the first time you could see mountains and in, in, in LA and in, in, in Northern India uh, and other places. And, and hopefully that um, will add the momentum to uh, social movements of, of the need to tackle uh, air pollution. Um, uh, so, it, so it has to happen at, both within develop and developing and, and developed countries or first world and third world countries. But again, I would put the onus on, on first world countries to deal with issues around externalizing their, their uh, 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 production and, and industrial processes. So again, that's, a, that's a, a, a thorny issue because it deals with international responsibility and the shifting of, of, of pollution to other countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Um, where's the conversation on uh, just switching uh, technology? You know, you talked about and touched on um, the need to not um, put in place, you know, fossil fuel, you know, operated plants, but also on the need to shut down. And, you know, in, in between there, there is, seems to be a significant opportunity to incentivize just reswitching which of course would be very expensive, but um, you know, how, how is that conversation playing out? Is it emphasized in your, in your view? So, um, one of the, the like, 
easiest and in inverted commas things that should happen is the ending of fossil fuel subsidies. And this has been discussions at, like at federal level in many countries to the G20, the G8 and so on and so forth. And there's been promises made at the G20 level that has been broken, but ending fossil fuel subsidies is, is a low hanging fruit that should happen, okay? Um, again, uh, Pete Erickson at Stockholm Environment Institute and colleagues have done some fantastic studies around this that show that fossil fuels um, receive in the region of five to one times or, you know, five times more subsidies than renewables. So there's this myth around that, that renewables are, you know, uh, uh, only functioning because they're subsidized. But in fact, it's the fossil fuel industry that has historically, you know, for over a century or more has, has been the one that has been uh, subsidized. So subsidies has to play a, a critical role in this. There's other studies conducted by um, folks out of Berkeley and Stanford that show that, you know, wind, water, wave energy, that we have sufficient wind, water, and wave energy uh, capabilities at an international level to make the switch, that we don't need to rely on nuclear or other, um, uh, or other uh, resources. Um, but what is missing is, is uh, I mean, we, yeah, and then and thirdly, yeah, we can't build any more fossil fuel infrastructure because there, uh, what happens in you have carbon lock-in, so like a gas plant can last for 30 to 40 years or so. Um, and there are some costs, uh, you know, uh, once that, that uh, plant is up and running, it's very hard to, to shut it down. Um, so we need to, to shake up the system. But I would say subsidies are subsidies and political will are, are two, two big things. And finally, just infrastructurally and in terms of, of technology and engineering, I mean, it, there will be millions of jobs created around building new electric a clean electrical grid i mean that would just be a huge undertaking um so we would have the same level as fdr type employment needs yeah. can you uh can you talk a little bit about this tension that um often you would hear well you know if you're going to be creating you know so many millions of jobs and well-paid jobs if in this green economy it's actually more consumption and consumerism and more um detrimental to the environment like how does the climate movement see this issue <laughs> the climate justice movement yeah i mean this is a this is a tricky one and something that I, i've been kind of grappling as well you know there's a whole cohort of, of brilliant scholars that work on degrowth you know uh, and they argue that you know we need mass uh, i mean if you look at Consumption levels in the US, it's like four to five times that of the Netherlands. And then if you compare it to somewhere like Nigeria, it's something like 20 times or so. So like tackling huge levels of, of consumption in first world countries, you know, will make a, 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 a big a big difference. Um, the there is a challenge uh, and it's kind of a thorny one around the rebound effect. So if you you know, create all these energy efficiencies in buildings that people have more disposable income. And what do they do with that income? Is it spent on, you know, flying to the Caribbean or, or whatnot? So there is, I, I think, uh, an important issue there around rebound effects that need to be to be tackled. Um, the discussions on degrowth are, are, are <laughs> fascinating and, and really contested. Uh, me personally, I, I uh, I really hate when the conversation gets to a level when we're talking about straws or whether recycling. I mean, recycling around 8% of stuff that in the US that's put out for recycling actually gets recycled. Mm -hmm. um, what needs to happen is more collective action that are taking on the petrochemical industries that pr produce all this plastic in the first place. That is far more important than considering whether you take a straw or not. Okay, I mean, we don't need straws, but... Uh, it's much better to focus on the petrochemical industry who are producing their products are the fossil fossil fuels and plastics. Um, so um, again, I think that's a really uh, uh, interesting debate and there is genuine issues around rebound effect, but I think the, the focus should be on um, uh, as Matt Huber likes to say, that you know, seizing the means of the production and what are what are these folks doing in producing all this stuff? 
Yeah. And, and, fo uh, and that is where we should uh, uh, focus our energies. Yeah, I, I've always thought that there's something very pernicious in this argument, the implication that if people have good jobs and earn decent living is going to be, um, you know, detrimental to the environment, that we have the, the justice movement and the, ju the, the thinking about what is climate justice is, in fact, a thinking of how we live well and sustainably. And so these are the questions of uh, what we consume, how it is produced, and yes, there, I think there, it is a question of absorbing the wage. You know, if we are to generate good, decent incomes, um, how those incomes are then spent and kind of emphasizing the sorts of things that we need in life that are underemphasized, like the care work that you mentioned, the work of artists and the work of other kind of services, cultural, educational kind of uh, consumption that is not extractive and um, not environmentally devastating. So um, the questions are really bigger about how we live um, and then how we organize that, that life. And um, I, I just really appreciate how you provided us a really comprehensive picture of the multi-pronged challenge before us, but also uh, you know the, the rays of hope that this is not a um, formidable, uh, challenge and that we don't really have an alternative, right? <laughs> we have to tackle it. <laughs> the only option is a radical option at, at, this, at this point. At this and point. radical means staying within, like creating a liv livable planet. So that's not even radical. That's right. Uh, that's right. Um, I thank you very much for, for your time um, and for just uh, lots of food for thought. Um, thank you to our guests who also joined us, and uh, we will make these recordings also available um, after the series is over. So thank you, Noel, very much. Thank you for having me, and thanks to everyone uh, uh, for great questions. And, and uh, yeah, I hope everyone uh, stays involved and active in your communities and, and acting as a collective. That's the, the most important thing that we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.